So I'm Cathy Scott from Yorkshire and Humber Academic Health Science Network and it's lovely to see you all this morning. And I'd like you to uh, start by imagining a world where suppliers of services to the NHS know exactly what's required of them when it comes to their net zero obligations, both now and in the future, and are able to discharge those responsibilities, leading to better bids and more success, as well as less harm to the environment from delivering healthcare. So this session is the first in a series of sessions run by Hill Dickinson and Yorkshire and Humber Academic Health Science Network, and they aim to give you the information you need to understand what the NHS requires of you in relation to net zero, and to help you understand your own net zero impact and how to monitor and reduce to give you a better chance of successfully working with the NHS. So a variety of sessions that aim to be useful to you and your company. So just briefly why I'm heading this up uh, or hosting this, I should say, uh, as well as being Deputy Chief Exec of Yorkshire and Humber Academic Health Science Network, I'm also the lead for um, Net Zero uh, on the AHSN for the AHSN network, although Pete, who you'll hear from later, does the, the majority of the work. And today you're going to hear about procurements and you're going to hear from Ariel from Hill Dickinson, Pete from the AHSN network, and Annalisa from Newcastle upon Tyne Hospitals. And, and all of those have some real um, deep understanding of the subject matter today. So before we move on to the session, just some housekeeping. So we will be recording the session and we will also um, circulate all the materials after the event. Uh, the Teams webinar will hopefully spotlight the presenter um, and audio visual will be enabled for the audience during Q&A. When we've run webinars for, um, for the NHS or for innovators, what we've found is that there's real value in using the chat function, not just for asking questions, but to share your experiences, the barriers that, that you've come across and any solutions that you've found. So if you can do that, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, when we come, we've got a, an audio Q&A at the end, but if you wanted to ask questions in the interim, I'll be keeping a note and make sure that they're addressed as, as far as we can. Do put up your hand to ask the questions at the end. And if your question relates to a specific speaker, please start your question with their name. Uh, I think that was everything, Amanda. Um, but uh, moving on now to the agenda, you will hear from Ariel, as I said, uh, and Ariel is starting up now, so I'll hand over. Thank you. Hello, um, let me share my screen. You able to see that OK? Yeah, that's perfect. OK, excellent. So, yeah, thank you so much for having me this morning. Um, oops, sorry, I've got to get into the right place. There we go. OK, so I'll be covering um, carbon reduction plans. I obviously wasn't at the first event. So um, my name is uh, Ariel Edesis and I'm the ESG senior analyst for Hill Dickinson. So I'll be covering quite a broad look at it. Um, what they are. <laughs> what it cuts a lot of background around climate change and, and our experience. So I wanted to start with a definition and I know that climate change, we, this is why we're all here. We hear it constantly. Um, it's nothing new, but I think it's worth just reminding ourselves what climate change actually is. So the Cambridge Di Dictionary definition is changes in the world's weather, in particular the fact that it is believed to be getting warmer as a result of human activity, increasing the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. On the right, it is a visual created, I believe, by the University of Reading. And this is actually showing us what this temperature spiral looks like from the last 200 years. So going from what was the average temperature 200 years ago outwards to this limit set by the Paris Agreement of 1.5 degrees Celsius. So you can see as this is spiraling outwards, a clear example of this temperature getting warmer faster. Now this stops at 2016, but you can see already how close we were to hitting that limit even then. So let me go to the next one. So this is just another visual example of what climate change is actually looking like. This is called the climate stripes. This is also created by the same group at the University of Reading. And this is representing average global temperatures over the last two centuries. So we could see held a pretty average level for quite a long time. And it's quite evident when we started to hit industrial um, action, or sorry, in more industrial uh, emissions and then in the more recent years it is clear that these temperatures are getting hotter much faster so these are just two visual examples of what climate change is actually looking like at a temperature level but what does it look like for us for the world right now so it might look like increased anxiety especially amongst young people who aren't sure what the world is going to look like as they get older 
it might look like what we what it might have considered as extreme weather being our new normal weather. So where we used to have extreme heat, which felt like you know more than normal last year, that's just the new norm. It might look like in a place like California, for example, a deluge of different storms. It might be fires, floods, droughts, all at the same time. It's very geographically dependent and overall it's just a general world where things feel really volatile unstable the word extreme i think hardly means anything anymore because each year we hear new extreme weathers new extreme uh, uh, temperatures all this is to say that we're not here to talk about just that reality which is grim it's to talk about what we can do about it so the IPCC, the International Panel of Climate Change, has recently released a synthesis report. They released, uh, I believe, six reports over the last year, which is pulling together all uh, the, the reality of climate change, what it looks like on the ground, what, it, what has caused it, what's, what it's, how it's affecting different people. But it's also created for us a concrete action plan on what we can do from governments to businesses to individuals to help limit this warming as close to that 1.5 degree goal as possible. So the, the idea and the reason that we're all here is not to stop and look at all this really grim news and say, well, let's give up and sit back. It's to look at this and say, well, what do we do next? So in the UK, um, we live in a country which has actually created legally binding long-term carbon budgets going back to 2008. And those budgets and those goals have been updated with the science. So it's currently set at the goal to cut emissions by 78% by 2035 and to reach net zero by 2050. This is the UK's goal, it's quite ambitious. With this ambitious goal, um, a nonprofit group which ranks policies has ranked the UK's target as almost sufficient. So we are doing OK, we have a lot of work to be done. Our domestic target is actually an acceptable one, according to this group. But right down to climate finance, we're still in the highly insufficient category. All of this puts the UK as one of only nine countries that actually achieve this almost sufficient ranking, which is currently the highest. Not one country reaches the acceptable category. So there's still a lot of work to be done. So this is bring the, brings us to what the NHS is doing in the NHS's role. Now, the NHS was the world's first health service to commit to net zero, and they've actually gone further. They're more ambitious than the UK as a whole, where they've set the goal to achieve net zero by 2045. They have defined net zero for themselves as to cut the emissions that they control directly or their own carbon footprint to net zero by 2040 and to cut what they're calling their NHS carbon footprint plus the emissions that they influence by 2045. And it's in this space, this NHS carbon footprint plus, that everybody here has a real, um, we need to pay close attention because we fall under that space that the NHS may not directly control, but they absolutely can influence. And through these carbon reduction plans, this is how they're influencing it. So any supplier organization who falls in scope will need to be producing these carbon reduction plans. So. I, again, I know this is going to be information that everybody here is likely very familiar with, but just a quick rundown of what your carbon reduction plan should be including. These are just taken right from the um, the website describing them. They need to be published on your supplier's website, so they need to, need to be publicly available. They need to be signed off within 12 months of procurement. It needs to show sign off, which confirms the supplier's commitment, and that sign off needs to happen at the appropriate level. So it needs to show that you've got leadership buying into this plan. You need to be describing your um, greenhouse gas emissions, otherwise known as, or you might be more familiar with carbon footprint, and you need to be detailing the environmental management measures, so the steps that you're going to be taking to actually reach that net zero goal. These are links, again, I'm sure you're really familiar with, but I've just included them at the bottom um, if you want to dig into them later. So the next part of my presentation is going to be talking about our journey as Hill Dickinson. We are an in-scope organization. We do need to produce this carbon reduction plan. So this is not to say this is exactly the right way to do it, but it is to share our journey and to hopefully help you if wherever you are on that journey, just to know what our experience is um, and to give some guidance or, or some of the lessons that we're learning as we go. So I'm going to be covering where should you start? how to look at what needs to be prioritized, what data sets you need to be considering, and then some suggested sustainability measures. So I think a good place to start, and this has been our journey, is to define what net zero actually means to you as an organization. So net zero is another one of these terms which is used 
very regularly, but perhaps not understood as deeply as it needs to be. And it essentially means that net zero is where we've negated all the emissions in the atmosphere to reach a level equal with how much we've emitted. Now, because we do not live in a world where we have where we can be at zero emissions, there will be some emissions happening somewhere. This essentially means that we're going to have to at some point neutralize or offset those emissions. So you need to determine within your organization how low you want to get your emissions before you need to rely on offsets. You need to ensure that leadership is on board. So this isn't a task that's done from one area in your organization, but it needs to be all encompassing and you need to ensure that there's buy in from the very highest levels. And finally, seek support. So whether that's internally, externally, wherever possible, this is a, a really challenging, big task. And it's important that we share information and, and kind of do this together. So whether it's through events like this or anywhere that you can get support, try to do that. Um, our journey started through the Science Based Targets Initiative, another area I'm sure is quite familiar to a lot of people. It's it's kind of become one of the most more globally accepted um, areas to submit targets to have them improved and show that they are in line with this limiting global warming at 1.5 degrees. So we were informed by the science based targets. We did set our commitment to the science based targets last year. We're in the process of still putting together our targets, but that's really helped us develop the carbon reduction plan because it provides. There's a lot of background, a lot of support, and it also gives a bit of a blueprint on what your carbon footprint might look like, how you'll track it, and whether it actually does adhere to the Paris Agreement. It also helps by setting short-term targets. So instead of just having this long-term net zero by 2045 or 2050, you also need to set shorter-term goals to ensure you are on track to get there. So at the bottom, I've just included a link. Again, if you'd like to dig in, I think this presentation will be sent around. Um, so that's for anybody who wants to learn more about science-based targets. Um, oops, there we, there we go. So this is a bit of our our roadmap, quite simplified. So we started by this is looking at um, how we're actually going to develop the carbon reduction plan. So the, the first step was to set boundaries. So we had to look at what is how does our organization work, what is what are the emissions that we are responsible for, and where do we need to draw the line and just say these are not within our realm of responsibility. Next is pulling together the data. So once you've figured out where your organizational boundaries lie, you need to actually identify which data is going to inform your carbon footprint. Once you have your data, it's time to measure that carbon footprint or your overall greenhouse gas emissions. Once you've got your baseline measurement, you can identify the hotspots, look at where can you pull levers, how can you make changes within your carbon, uh, sorry, your overall emission footprint and bring that number down. Set targets. So again, we know that there is a long term target. We need to achieve net zero, but set targets along the way to help you get there. Once you've got your target, you've got your long term goal, make a plan. What are the steps you're going to take to get there? Within that plan, you'll need to agree on projects. This is obviously a big step because this is where the real buy in needs to come from all levels of your organization. Once you've agreed on the projects that you're going to begin with, track that progress. Of course, this isn't something that we do once. It's something we do every single year. And then if that progress is not happening to the level that it needs to be, you'll need to adjust as needed. So I'm going to run through each of these steps. Um, I'll summarize, I'll go, I'll try not to take too long to go through them, but just to kind of go through what they actually look like. So the first step is to define your organizational boundaries. This can be um, an exercise which is quite a challenging one because as you actually start to dig into what you control, you can see that your level of control could extend out almost infinitely. So it's important to draw boundaries somewhere. The greenhouse gas protocol helps with this. Um, it's not, there is no exact way to draw your boundary, but there are three suggestions on what, on, depending on your organization, that will help you understand where that boundary lies. They are equity share, financial control, or operational control. There is no defined way of doing this. It will depend very much on your own organization. There is, There are examples within that greenhouse gas protocol, but these are sort of the three, three areas. So it depends on how you, how you run as a business. So once you've defined that boundary, it's time to start looking at what data is required. How are you gonna have, to, how are you gonna gather that data within the boundary of control? How are you then going to convert that data into your what's called equivalent CO2 or kilograms of equivalent carbon? So that's your greenhouse gas emissions. And then that's going to tell you what is your organization's carbon footprint equivalent. So again, I'm just going to do a quick definition. Carbon footprint 
is something that we hear often. We probably use it a lot. But again, I think it's worth reminding ourselves what it actually means. Our carbon footprint is the amount of carbon dioxide released into the atmosphere as a result of the activities of a particular individual, organization, or community. Now, the greenhouse gas protocol, which is the main source of, of uh, calculating your carbon emissions, it helps define what they look like, where to get the data from, breaks it down into these three categories. Your carbon footprint or your greenhouse gas emissions. By the way, I'm, I am using those interchangeably. It's not quite correct. Greenhouse gas emissions is made up of these six gases at the top, but we sort of refer to carbon footprint as the sort of catch-all. So each of these has a greenhouse, uh, sorry, a carbon uh, dioxide equivalent value. So when I'm saying carbon emissions, I'm also meaning greenhouse gases. Um, so scope one is, are your direct emissions. Those are the emissions that you directly control. They tend to be burning emissions. So it might be if whether you use natural gas to power your heating, so you're, you're burning gas on site. It might be that you own a lot of vehicles, you put fuel in those vehicles, those vehicles burn fuel. So you, again, that, those are all your direct scope one emissions. Scope two are your indirect emissions related to purchase heat, ele sorry, electricity, steam, heating, and cooling for your own use. So those are indirect because although that you are controlling how much electricity you might use, for example, you might switch on and off your lights, you're not really controlling where that electricity is being generated. So it's being generated elsewhere and brought to you, therefore it is an indirect emission. Scope one and two were sort of more traditionally the areas that um, we were tracking, and then the more recent years and through the carbon reduction plan, scope three is being more uh, recognized as the greatest contribution. It might even be as high as 95% of your contribution to emissions. It very much depends on company on, on how you run and your operations. But um, within scope three, there are, as laid out by the greenhouse gas protocol, up to 15 categories you might be tracking. We need to, to look at a minimum of about five of these for that carbon reduction plan. Those are your upstream and downstream transportation and distribution business travel, employee commuting, and waste generated in operations. And those, those kind of cover the minimum of areas that we need to be looking at. So the next thing is to look at how to actually measure from those areas. So this is, this is a, a bit of a real life example, the type of data that we had to collect to help us inform each one of those areas. So scope one data, again, that's direct fuel, might be the amount of fuel that you've put and burned into you, the cars that you own the annual kilowatt hours of gas usage. So knowing your overall usage across your whole business is gonna inform your uh, scope one, some of your scope one emissions. And then this, um, what I found to be a trickier area, which is your fugitive emissions. And that tends to be accidental emissions. It might be if you've got an air conditioner that needed to be topped up, that means that some air conditioner fluid has leaked and that falls under scope one as well. Scope two for us, that was something uh, annual kilowatt hours of electricity usage. Again, if you, you need to use a lot of steam or other uh, areas that fall under scope two, you'll be looking at your overall usage. Scope three covers, again, this is a minimum. This is this is about five categories of scope three, four or five. Um, there are up to 15. So you might know that your boundary goes a bit broader and you want to look at that broader boundary, but here's kind of the minimum example. You might be tracking the transportation and distribution of goods. So how far goods have traveled to get to you, how much they might travel to get away from you. Business travel, employee commuting. So for your employees, how are they getting into work? How often are they coming into work? How far are they traveling into work? Those kinds of questions would make up your employee commuting. And then waste and water use. So for waste, ideally you'd be tracking how much waste you're producing, how it's being disposed, is it being recycled, is it being reused, et cetera. And then the water use as well, that can both fall under your waste. And that's kind of the actual data you might, you, you, you would need to be collecting to put together this carbon footprint. The next step is to take this data and then put it all together and spit out your greenhouse gas emissions and that's what is required in this carbon reduction plan now this task is is a monumental huge task to do so i put a few links here of what if you want to do it yourself because you can do it yourself um, these could be really helpful one of the main ones is called the government conversion factors and that's where you take all the data which i showed in the previous slide you go to this very very in-depth spreadsheet which i won't share here because it might bore everyone to tears and actually look at for every kilowatt hour of gas what is the equivalent 
carbon dioxide or sorry, carbon emissions that comes from that. What you would then do to calculate your emissions from a very summarized perspective is you would look at each of the usage, convert that into its equivalent carbon um, carbon emissions, and then add all that up together. And that makes up your greenhouse gases. So if you want to actually dig into where this data is coming from, it's really interesting to go to that government site and just look into those spreadsheets. Even if you will get help externally, it's a helpful way to actually view um, one example that I found really interesting is recycling of plastic. We all we it's really important to recycle plastic. However, the emissions from recycling plastic are actually a lot higher than the emissions from dumping plastic into landfill. That isn't to say we dump that we should be dumping plastic into landfill. It's to say that simply just recycling isn't really going to be enough. It's going to be important to reduce what you use. So it's so I think it can be helpful to really look into those and familiar familiarize yourself a bit with those values. Then these two other links are just other resources to help you. The greenhouse gas protocol actually include, has some courses where you can learn a bit more, really dig into how to calculate your carbon footprint, and it also has this scope three evaluator. So that scope three might be just a bit too big, a bit too overwhelming to think about how it applies to you. So the scope three evaluator can be really helpful to narrow it down and understand what is applicable to you as an organization. So again, I'll send this around for you to dig into yourself. So. Identify hotspots. This is um, our example is, uh, for Hill Dickinson. This is what our footprint actually looks like, and this is what we'll be sharing. So when we actually share our carbon reduction plan, we're publicly showing our emissions. For us, it helps to visualize it. So to look at your, your hotspots, it's useful to see what they actually look like, how they're broken down into the different categories. Once you kind of see what are the big areas that might be contributing to your carbon, your greenhouse gas emissions, you can start to think about that next step, which is, oops, sorry, I'm go back here. It's just setting projects to actually reduce those down. So a visual example of your carbon uh, emissions is a very important step to helping you determine those projects. Okay, so once you've got your baseline measurement, it's time to set your targets. Now we know that our target is driven by the UK government and by the NHS, but for your own journey to get there, let's set goals. So I think most people know about the SMART goals. Now I've adjusted that acronym slightly to more reflect the problem that we are facing. So for me, SMART means science-based. Does it actually go along with the science? Are the steps that you're taking going to get us as close as we can to limiting warming to 1.5? Are they measurable? Can we quantify those goals? Can we actually check that they're, that they're working? If they're not, can we adjust? Are they ambitious? No longer are we living in a world where we can set goals based on what we know was achievable before because that actually wasn't working enough. So it's time to look at this goal and get really ambitious. What are steps that we can take that possibly push us outside our comfort zone? Are they relevant? Relevant to you as a business and relevant to that overall global goal? And are they time bound? At the end of the day, we're all trying to achieve net zero by at the latest 2050. And I've just bolded and underlined by because this isn't about we do nothing until 2050 and then hope we get there. We've got to be taking steps along the way to get to this goal at the latest by this 2050 um, time. So as an example of our target, so again, this is in line with what we need to be showing by the carbon reduction plan. We must state our, our goal to get to net zero, but again, informed by science-based targets, We've also set a shorter term goal to achieve a 50% reduction from our baseline of 2019 by 2030 and a 90% reduction by 2045. And that's recognizing again that there will be this residual 10% where we'll need to neutralize that through verifiable offsets, look into ways to partner with perhaps a nature-based solution or, or another way to neutralize that final 10% that we just can't quite get to zero. So next is to make a plan and agree on projects. And there's a few different approaches. So you can do baby steps, so consistently looking at small steps to get the same amount down every year. Or you could be bolder and might maybe look at something that could be a big initial investment or need a lot of buy-in internally. It might be a really challenging one, but it might have a bigger impact. And I've included on the right just a very simplified example of, of the outcome of two different approaches. Now, it's unlikely that you would do one or the other. You'd likely do a combination of big challenging steps, smaller steps, but it's good to visualize what happens. If we just take smaller 
gradual steps, we would go something along this blue line where we do achieve our net zero, for example, by 2045. Or we could take really big kind of perhaps scary or large investment steps, something that we need to do that's a big step initially and take more like this green line, a bit more of an exponential reduction and also achieve the same goal. Now, the reason I wanted to visualize these because either way that you get there, we get the same goal, but in the meantime, you're gonna continue to emit. And I think this is where a small bit of sort of basic calculus comes in. The area underneath each of these curves is the amount of emissions that you that you uh, that you still um, emit. So the area underneath this blue line, I was going to shade it in, but I haven't done that, is bigger than the area underneath that green line. So the space in between the green and the blue line would be the possible emissions saved in the meantime by taking a more uh, ambitious approach. And just to add, if you are, if you do choose to take more ambitious steps early on, you actually might buy yourself a bit of time later when it comes to those much more challenging steps. So it's worth exploring big steps early on. Get those emissions down as low as possible, as quickly as possible. Whichever step you take, it's going to require a lot of behavioral change and a lot of diplomacy. So you need to work with people within your organization to achieve these. This isn't about shaming people or or doing something from one level. It really needs to be a, a very holistic, all encompassing approach, which is why for us, it's also been extremely important to prioritize education. So our mission reduction goals is, of course, what's driving us, but prioritizing education and climate literacy is what's going to help us bring people along, adjust, help the culture, really help us shift towards our goals. This is just an example. So these are a few examples of the types of projects you might be looking at. Obviously, your own list will be much longer than this. There will be this is where you can really get into what is relevant again in your own business. But just as an example, if you don't have LED lights, that tends to be a, a pretty easy one. Switch to LED lights, large initial investment, but the amount of energy that they use is about 90 percent less than traditional bulbs. So that tends to be a, a kind of a low hanging fruit. If you drive a lot as part of your business, using only electric vehicles can help get those emissions down. Um, if you procure 100% renewable energy, whether that is through what's called a Rego plan or um, I've just I've just blanked. I'll have to come back to that. <laughs> There's different means of procuring 100% renewable energy, but that's going to help you get your scope two emissions down to zero. Actually, um, you might purchase products with thank you power purchase agreement. <laughs> <laughs> I just had a mind blank. So sorry, that was on renewable energy. You can either do what's called a Rego or a power purchase agreement. Um, you can purchase products with lower carbon footprint, maybe reduce travel. But I think no matter what you do, it's going to be important to embed climate actions into everyday decisions. So how you operate as a business, perhaps how you work with clients, these kinds of decisions should have at its base or some or driving it climate action. Stay on track. So this is when we need to measure, continually measure emissions. You need to, you could do it by quarterly or annually. Um, again, depending on your own business, I believe we're required to annually, annually at the minimum. So it might be better to do it more often if you can to try to ensure that you stay on track. You can also disclose your carbon emissions publicly. CDP, what used to be called the Carbon Disclosure Project, is a another really large globally recognized way of publicly disclosing your carbon emissions. It can help you, again, understand your own boundaries and what data. So this is just another example. No, CDP is not required. Neither is science-based targets. They're not required for your carbon reduction plan, but they, they can be very helpful. And then year on year, we should also try to improve the data quality. So it's likely in the first year of doing this, you might really struggle to have primary or really good quality data. You might struggle to get data at all. So rather than continually use exactly the same data, we should be trying to ensure that it gets a bit better each year. That'll just help us um, improve our estimated overall greenhouse gas emissions year on year. And finally, adjust as needed. This is not about doing exactly the same thing that you that you planned. If it doesn't work, retrace your steps, redo it. So just put this quote when it's obvious that the goal cannot be reached. Don't adjust the goals, adjust the steps. So this is about learning to live with a bit of uncertainty, reassessing, modifying, adapting the steps that you take. 
And I realize I've probably gone way over my time, so I'm just going to finish with this quote, which I liked. What is the use of a house if you haven't got a toler pl tolerable planet to put it on? So this is all of our responsibility, whether we, whatever business you're in, and we, we I think are quite lucky to be in the space where we are actually driven by government and policy to make these changes. So thank you very much. And I apologize, I've probably gone way over. Some contacts at Hill Dickinson, myself or Jamie Foster, who's also here. Um, so thank you very much. I will stop sharing. And thank yeah, you. thank you. Thank you, Ariel. That was really, really insightful and interesting. A couple of uh, points that, that really resonated with me. Um, so important to get the leadership on board, that that really, really is critical uh, because culture comes from the top and this is all about behavioural change, as you, you also commented on. So to get that, that behavioural change, you need a change in culture. Recycling isn't enough. I think that's becoming increasingly apparent. Um, and the need to evolve and adapt your, your approach and your strategy if what you're doing isn't working. So thank you very much for, for, for that. That was really helpful. Uh, I'd like to move us on now to Pete. Pete, do you want to uh, come in and introduce yourself and get started? Thank you. Morning, everyone. Yeah, let me um, just share my screen. Um, here we go. Yeah, morning. Um, I'm Pete Waddingham. I'm the Net Zero Lead uh, for the Academic Health Science ne Network, as Cathy's alluded to. Um, I just wanted to uh, give a brief introduction to me, just to, to bring to life who I am, just a little bit about my, my background. I've been working for the Academic Health Science Network for the last five years. I've had the privilege of working on lots of different projects from cardiovascular disease to supporting in the enterprise and innovation team and supporting innovators. Um, and in the last couple of years, I've been involved in net zero uh, within Yorkshire and Humber and now at national level. Uh, prior to that, I spent 10 years as commissioning manager in the NHS. Uh, again, I was privileged to touch on many different health service areas, uh, a lot of community services, musculoskeletal services, urgent care, etc. Uh, and involved in lots of procurement, which obviously is the topic of today. Um, and I spent about eight years working for the local authority in housing and in, in programme management. And also spent a couple of years working for the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust, managing um, a, a nature reserve at Spain Point, and, and that is that nature reserve. That's me on top of a Grade 2 listed lighthouse uh, with fantastic panoramic views over East Yorkshire um, and uh, looking over that fantastic wildlife. So I've, I've been around the public sector, the NHS, uh, and also around the sort of nature and conservation uh, side of things. And, and, and hopefully those skills bring together um, support that I can now offer companies um, around net zero and I want to give you a little bit of flavour of that so my plan of action today I, I do want to I know Ariel's talked about this but I do want to just briefly emphasise the importance of why we are doing this again and um, I'm going to provide a brief overview of the support the HSNs are offering I'll bring to life some examples of companies who are starting their journey and this is a journey for everyone um, and uh, we, you know, we need people to start. So I'll bring to life some of those. And then finally, I'm just going to touch on social value because it is part of net zero. And I think it's important to to cover all of these interconnected topics, certainly when we're talking about procurement. Uh, but I just wanted to thank, uh, well, thank you for the opportunity to speak and, and thank you for those that have taken the time to come along and listen. Uh, it is appreciated and it's, it's needed. Um, so in terms of um, the report that Ariel's alluded to, the, the climate change report, the IPCC report, the sixth report, um, the next one actually isn't due out till 2030. But when you do look at the um, uh, the key messages in there, essentially what it's saying is we're going to struggle to hit this 1.5 degree target. And, you, and some of you probably have heard about this 1.5 degree target before. So it's becoming highly unlikely that we will hit that target. And in fact, when you do step back and look at it scientifically, pragmatically, you just wonder how off the mark we might be if we don't really put some urgent action into this. Um, so there are some quite stark warnings in that report, and it's worth checking out. It's probably a little bit technical in places. So I've just pulled out uh, one particular infographic that I really liked. And I was thinking about this the other day as I was walking the dog. But um, I mean, like us all, I'm, I'm sure we'd all love to live to a, a, an elderly age. But the reality is, is that when you get you know, when you get old, we all know that that life becomes a little bit harder, a bit trickier. Um, but that is going to be even harder when we've got some real severe temperatures, extremes of weather, um, excess flooding again, um, you know, um, adverse weather. 
we've already seen the impacts this year of, of that adverse weather. The, the 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 heat wave in the summer sadly did kill people. You know those those deaths. Um, there there have been deaths due to this excess weather. So it's not always about these other countries that we sometimes see on the news. This is happening here in the UK. And again, just from my own personal perspective, I'm a flood warden in the area I live. The property I live in floods. You know that the reality is is that in 10 to 15 to 20 years time, the, these extreme um, uh, weather events are going to happen more and more but even if we just take the heat for example when you're elderly you know being being in that heat is going to be very uncomfortable so I just thought that that infographic there was quite useful because it kind of plots um, different stages of um, of you know if you were born uh, back in 1960 you know this is what you're experiencing now which a lot of elderly people are but but actually it's about um, you know depending on where you were born on that graph but I often think about my children you know my children I've got young children um, uh, 11 and 9 but you know I, I often think about what is the world that they're going to grow up in and it, and it, it can be quite terrifying really and it, it's it, it's a shame that we've got such a, a problem but we struggle at times to deal with it so there is an urgency to this and uh, I don't want to frighten people too much but I think it is important to always keep testing ourselves and go and do our own research of why we're doing it um, and then just this final one really quickly as well someone posted this that we work with really closely um it was around plastic pollution and I thought again it was a really sort of telling statement uh, from this report uh, the Madeira Monaco Commission on Plastics and Human Health but it's now clear that the current patterns of plastic production use and disposal are not sustainable and are responsible for significant harms to human health the environment and the economy as well as for deep societal injustices and now again do check out both of those reports but you know the way that we're living on planet earth is really really uh, uh not, not the way that we should be and um, again i don't want to um frighten people too much because the, the good news is that there are some brilliant people out there there's some brilliant innovations and i think as part of this journey that we all go on we can all contribute even small to help change and build that movement that we need so that we can live on planet earth sustainably and with the wealth that people enjoy and the you know the prosperity because you know ultimately people need jobs and they need income but we need it sustainably so just in terms of the work that we've been doing as an HSN, I'm only going to bring a few of these to life today because we haven't got too much time. But we do a lot of sharing and learning events um, and we bring to life some of the innovations that we're working with. Last week, I uh, ran an air pollution uh, session that was really good. We showcased about four innovators, had a clinical perspective of, again, why should we be tackling air pollution? Um, I mean, the fact, again, in the UK, there's about 30,000 plus deaths a year. Uh, attributed to to air pollution and that probably is a, a, a staggering underestimate and um, so we had a clinical perspective and we showcased some innovators uh, but our next one on the 28th of April and I'd love people to come along to this if you're interested in but it is on uh, data carbon accounting and monitoring impact so the topic that we're kind of talking about today uh, and Annalisa is going to be one of our guest speakers on there so it should be a really good session um, but it does, it's made me realise that, you know, we need to help companies. Um, yes, we're going to talk to you about how to create a carbon reduction plan, social value. You can do it on your own, as Ariel said. Uh, but actually, there's also some companies out there looking at it through different approaches. And, and we'd love to bring those to life so that you can see the types of resources out there. So, yeah, um, I'll, I'll put it in the chat as well. Uh, but please do come along to that on the 28th of April. Um, this book that, that again, I just wanted to pull this together. Um, it's, it's a resource list that I've pulled together, but I found it really helpful in my own job. And again, I'm well, um, happy to share it, but it's got lots and lots of different resources on different topics that can help people on their net zero and greener NHS journey. Everything from carbon calculators to some examples of carbon reduction plans, right through to maybe some of the more important things about funding sources. Um, there's a there's a, a category there where you can just easily search for, for things that I stumble across in terms of funding and net zero. We've got a brilliant net zero funding bulletin as an HSN network that organisations can sign up to that again brings it together. But there are multiple places um, where some of this funding exists. Um, some really good funding actually for innovators uh, helping to decarbonize so their energy. So depending on what um, uh, organization you're currently working in, um, you know, if, you, if you're manufacturing a consumable product for the NHS, um, you, you know, there, there are pots of money there that can help you decarbonize. So I've brought all of those together uh, in a bookmark bar that I add to um, almost on a daily basis. Uh, and there's just a screenshot of some of the tags that you can see across the top. Unfortunately, I can't see it because it's not as big on my screen. 
Um, but yeah, as I said, is everything from carbon calculators, carbon plans, right through to um, information on plastics and recycling waste management. So it's just sometimes a good place to go and get a little bit of uh, inspiration on, um, uh, you know, uh, things that you can implement or, or ways to find information. Uh, let me just whip through that one again. Uh, and and um, for those that don't know uh, about the HSN, uh, we've just launched our new landing page, uh, our website, and there's some great resources on there. Um, you can find out the support that we offer innovators and some of the work that we've been doing uh, and register your innovation if you've not, if you've not already registered, because we'd love to hear from people that have got a net zero offering and, and where you are on your journey. So again, do check out that website. So a couple of things again that we've been doing um, and it builds on today really we've, we've kind of focused on two things and i'm not going to go into detail today about about these but we've been helping people and organizations think about how to begin to quantify the impacts of their innovation because actually that's that's quite important if if someone's delivering um uh, an improved patient pathway what could that impact be in terms of carbon because a lot you know traditionally the nhs are looking at how can that improve patient outcomes how can that um, help reduce financial resources but we've got to put a different lens on that as well or add a different lens to that which is around the the carbon quantification so I'll, I'll touch on that in a little uh, in a second as well just with some examples uh, and yeah we've been helping people to think about uh, how to create a carbon reduction plan which Ariel's done a brilliant job of today so I'm not going to um, uh, go over that again um, in terms of quantifying the carbon impacts of their innovation, again, as, as Ariel said, there's a lot of conversion factors out there. A few people have been um, creating some conversion factors on pathways of care. So this spreadsheet in front of you just shows some examples of, you know, what does a GP consultation um, uh, average uh, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions? What about an inpatient stay? There are lots of other numbers floating around. Um, this is another uh, trusted source. It's by the Sustainable Healthcare Coalition, who we know really well. Uh, they've developed a Care Pathways Carbon Footprint Calculator. So it's just a good way of starting to think if you want to look at um, quantifying the impacts of your innovation. And, and these are equally important, as I'll, I'll talk about at the end, but knowing the impact of your business and potentially the impact of your innovation um, are, are really important because it might be that you can shave off and, and, and reduce uh, emissions on the products and the innovation that you're delivering. So they do go hand in glove. Um, so just some key points on, on that. Um, yeah, you know, we, we're trying to get people to quantify the potential impacts of their innovation because it is helpful for the NHS to understand, um, uh, you know, that they're looking for opportunities of how they can reduce their carbon emissions. So the supply chain, as Ariel said, is vitally important. And if you're a supplier to the NHS, they're going to want to know, you know, what, what is your carbon footprint as an organisation, but actually what could your impact of your innovation or service offer? And um, calculations, again, as Ariel said, you know, we need to make them good enough. There are ways that you can do full life cycle analysis that will come in future years. Actually, the, by 2028, they're looking at full product service uh, carbon footprints. Um, but the, and there are resources that can help you do life cycle analysis and some examples that, again, they're on that bookmark bar. If you if you search for life cycle analysis, you'll get some inspiration there. But um, you know, really, at this stage, we're trying to just get a feel of and, and hopefully help you get a feel of the impact of your innovation. And again, we've already touched on this, but the main thing is having a carbon reduction plan. That is a, a requirement for suppliers going forward. Um, and we can help you as HSM. We can sign post you to these resources uh, and offer some guidance. So I'm just going to bring to life a couple of companies, if that's OK. First one, Definition Health. They are on our digital accelerator program. It's a collaboration between the four HSNs in the north, and we've put a net zero lens on this. Um, but they are a, a company that looks at a surgical end-to-end -end pathway digital solution. But they've started um, quantifying the potential impacts of their innovation uh, to help streamline the surgical process. And they've started putting together a carbon reduction plan because of the work that we're, we're doing in collaboration with them. So that's brilliant. We've got companies um uh, like definition health open medical another good example of a company again um uh, we, we've supported open medical we know they've been success successful with some sbri funding in fact a couple of the others that i've got on here have also been successful but yeah the, they're starting to quantify how can they help the health system put a carbon cost to their pathway solution so if you are a nhs trust deploying their solution they've got a dashboard uh with some carbon conversion factors built into it and it just it just makes life easier for people to bring some of these numbers to life 
Uh, Patient Knows Best uh, were one of the companies that I worked with um, early on. They were part of the Sustainable Healthcare Coalition. Uh, and again, using live actual data of, of, of the reductions that they've had on some key services across the country. And um, they put some carbon uh, cost down of their innovation. But again, another company that have got a carbon reduction plan in place um, uh, and are flying that flag for net zero. Uh, and last but not least, B. Braun. I really like uh, B. Braun. It's a company that I've worked with for a while. They've got a knee sensor, but they were a company that I've just seen a recent report. They actually did more of like a life cycle analysis to their um, uh, knee sensor. So instead of people having to go into hospital for uh, physiotherapy, um, you could actually stay at home, reduce your travel, reduce the bed and on the NHS and the pressures. Uh, but actually they've looked at, well, what is that product made of, um, et cetera, and what is the carbon impact of that? So a good example of a company that uh, are trying to keep constantly evolving and, and taking those steps towards understanding their products and its potential impact. Actually, there was one more uh, jump. Uh, uh, there were another SBRI winner, a patient, in, uh, sorry, a staff engagement platform. And again, I'm sure uh, Annalisa will touch on this, but it's really important to get staff in board and understanding the numbers um, and, and get them engaged in this process um, so that we can start uh, making those small incremental steps to reducing carbon as a business, uh, collate them up and actually celebrate some success and, um, and Jump's platform helps does that. Um, so social value, uh, I just wanted to uh, say finish on social value really. I'm, I'm not a social value expert, but as I said, I have spent a lot of years uh, in procurement and commissioning in the NHS um, and I was involved in, in creating lots of tender documentation and all the information I'm just going to quickly touch on is based on credible sources, as as, as all these presentations. But um, yeah, the, the UK government um, did issue um, guidance about social value, which the NHS has adopted. But what happens is people start copying and pasting uh, various documents. Now, I, I saw that um, often in, in procurement when I was working, but you've got some government guidance on net zero. And you can kind of see there's only some slight differences, but the government's on the left little table. NHS is on the right and um, both have five themes they've kind of mixed them up slightly um, but what I'm suggesting to people is it's not a massive issue but start with the NHS you know we're here to support the NHS so let's use the NHS's definition of social value and the categories the five categories they've got as I said net zero is one of them and actually on this slide here in this table that's really helpful uh, and the links on the presentation just gives you some examples um, of, of where you can kind of think about contributing uh, to net zero from a social value perspective as well as the other areas on well-being equal opportunity, tackling economic inequality and COVID recovery is still one of those social value areas. Um, so yeah, ha have a look at those documents. Uh, and again, just from my experience, there's a, another uh, table called the social value quick reference table. It creates model answers, um, uh, model questions, model answers and awarding criteria. So the reason I'm showing this is there is a lot of information in that document, but I'm thinking, how might I use this if I was a procurement person? And actually, when I'm building my questions in tender responses, I'm probably going to look at stuff like this and I'll be looking at other people's procurement and tender documentations. And there are some metrics on the right hand side. So I know you can't see this because it's a bit busy, but there's some metrics of how they uh, start um, proposing to measure some of these areas. So that was interesting to me. So again, I kind of built myself a quick spreadsheet just to look at some of the metrics that might be uh, used in tenders. So we can start familiarising ourselves now with yeah, what might the contract be awarded on, uh, areas of questioning. Um, and then I stumbled across this organisation that we've worked with as well, the Social Value Portal. Really useful, um, really good company. And what they can do is help put a pounds and pence measurement to, to social value. Um, so there's a portal there that's actually free to use. Um, it is worth going on. It's, it doesn't take too long just to kind of get your head around it. And they've got some uh, national um, um, measurement uh, indicators. And I'll just show you a couple of examples on here. Um, they, they put essentially, as I said, a pounds and pence value next to lots of different social value indicators so really you can just kind of go through them eyeball them and go right where is a company could we add social value where are we currently doing that um, and what does that look like in pounds and pence it's a bit like the conversion factors for carbon but you can put a pounds and pence next to social value um, so yeah lots of um, uh, uh, documents there just to, to go through um, and have a look and, and as a business, as I said, think about your social value because the 10% weighting that people will have seen 
um, is around net zero and social value. So it's important that you kind of get your head around both of those. And one of those um, uh, requirements will be to have a carbon reduction plan um, and then yeah, talk about net zero and social value. And I'm sure the auction humber HSM won't mind me saying, but you know, we've already seen tenders come out, haven't we, where where that's been asked for, both net zero and social value. So it's important to do that. And I just thought I'd put this up from the social value. Uh, the license um is under a, a non-commercial creative license, but essentially you can use their information um uh, but you just can't sell it. So you know you can't sell it for commercial reasons, but you can absolutely use it for putting in a, a bid uh, that might get you a commercial contract. It's just that you can't sell their information. So as I said, really, really good, useful organisation. Um, and, and so I think, you know, stick with the social value definition according to the NHS. Look at organisations like the social value portal just to see if it can help you provide a good answer. So just some final thoughts from me then. Um, and again, I think this has been said already, but um, it doesn't have to be perfect. But make a start, just put pen to paper, really start collating some of the areas the quick wins you know whether it be your electricity bill um, some of your spend data etc just start putting pen to paper and um, yeah the carbon reduction plan will be essential uh, be an essential piece of um uh, of a product when you're going for tenders uh, and as a business and, and as i said for the reasons that we need to do that and um, so so make make that a priority really um, and your contribution to social value as i said that's in tenders but quantifying the impact of the innovation that's that's equally important and useful and and not that difficult potentially just to to come up with some uh you know some some outlined figures where you can start seeing where the the, the potential contribution could be and um, again this is probably being said but the how to reduce the cap carbon footprint is the little bit more challenging so once you've got your baseline how do you go about um, reducing your carbon but as we've said as well there are there's lots of inspiration out there lots of projects examples innovation i say there's funding available uh, to decarbonize so you know you're not you're not alone here and um, do keep and collect any tender submissions you know if you are putting in tenders obviously this session is about procurement so that feedback from buyers because then you can constantly improve you know maybe they said you know there wasn't enough information here so do do keep and collate those and, and reflect on them ask if you're struggling i mean you know hill dickinson are there we're here as a yorkshire number hsm but do ask if you're struggling lots of people are going that way and um, I, I love people to promote the work on social media and to stakeholders obviously i want people to talk about this if you've got a carbon reduction plan in place tell people you've got a carbon reduction plan if you've quantified the impact of your innovation tell people you've done that help us build that movement that's so essentially needed um, and but but as i said right at the beginning make sure you and your organization start with the why we're doing this it is massively important. This lack of action, even this small scale that we can all contribute, we're going to have catastrophic impacts for us and our children if we don't do these um, small steps now and start building that movement. Uh, so thank you. Um, I'm, I think the question and answers is at the end. I've put my social media handles in there, but I'll put them in the chat as well. I'd love to connect with you. I've actually just set up yesterday a LinkedIn group for people supporting the NHS um, on Net Zero. And I think uh, you know the more that we can collaborate, more that we can come together, uh, the more that we can help contribute to this important agenda. So thank you for your time and um, hope that was helpful. Thank you, Pete. That was really, really interesting as always. Um, I particularly liked your points on social value, which is obviously going to be um, a big thing. And also your point about making a start, it, it can feel really, really overwhelming, but you just need to start somewhere. Uh, and someone who has started somewhere and Newcastle upon Tyne hospitals are, are, are really experienced in this area. So I'm looking forward to what Annalisa has to say about their journey and, and their procurement uh, approach. Annalisa, over to you. Thank you very much. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, we can. Share. Great. I'll just share my slide. I've just put a few different links in the chat box if people want to access links about more information that I'm going to cover in my presentation. Oh, hold on, sorry, I put that in presenter mode. Has that come through? it doesn't show me that it's presenting yeah, it has it has Annalisa do you want to just practice moving on a slide so to make sure that um that works yeah all looks good 
All right, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, we seem to be about 15 minutes behind on the agenda. Am I still OK for my usual? I can see Amanda nodding, so I've still got my full slot. OK, that's brilliant. Uh, there is a little bit of overlap, which is really helpful, I think, from the previous presentation. So I might be able to, to cover those quickly, but it's quite good just to reinforce some of the, the key messages. I've really enjoyed those first two presentations and and thank you very much for inviting me along to to um to, to share our story. So I'm going to give a case study from Newcastle Hospitals. And as I say, I have put an ASHN case study into the chat box there, as well as a link to our um, web page on Newcastle Hospital's website that is for suppliers to access. And I've also referenced some training courses that are available. So before I get started, I'll just explain that I wear multiple hats. And um, so you may uh, have, have uh, you know, I may have connected with some of you in various different guises. So just to make this this crystal clear, um, I work part time as a sustainability manager at Newcastle Hospitals. I've been there for nearly three years and I'm the sustainability manager. Um, but I also run my own business, Smart Carbon Limited, which I've been running since 2016. Uh, we have a small team of people. Um, we're working with tens of trusts and hundreds of suppliers at the moment, but thousands of companies overall when you consider all the sectors that we that we work in. I've also had a long term role as an associate lecturer at Northumbria University teaching on the MSc and the BSc courses um, to greater or lesser extents, really depending on my time availability. Um, but I do contribute to the um, carbon footprinting course that I've linked in the chat box. So we have got an IEMA approved, university approved two day course, advanced course in carbon footprinting. Um, there's a half day module, a one day module or a two day module, depending how much you want to, to cover. I'm also in IEMA's Climate Change and Energy Steering Group, and I'm a trained climate reality leader, which means that I've um, completed three days training with Al Gore on uh, delivering his, um, you've, I'm sure you'll have seen an inconvenient truth and his uh, updated version as well. So yeah, it does feel sometimes a little bit like this picture in the bottom right hand corner here that I just found on uh, Ecosia. So today, clearly, I'm wearing my NHS hat. So what we'll be covering today is a, a snapshot case study of just the work at Newcastle Hospitals. Um, so I'll start with the beginning, you know, how we established our baseline, how we've measured and reported our progress. And importantly, the focus for today is supplier engagement for net zero by 2040. So for those of you that don't know Newcastle Hospitals, the right hand side here, Geordie Hospitals is a TV show. If I don't know if anybody's seen that, but it's brilliant and makes me very, very proud to be part of the, the organisation. Um, but some of our facts there on the left hand side, we are one of the largest NHS trusts in the UK with over two million patient contacts a year. Um, I've highlighted in red some of the key points. So there's £780 million pounds spent each year. That's when I've discounted the, pet, the amount spent on pay. So that is um, therefore a lever for change. I just see that as an opportunity to influence the supply chain um, towards net zero and a more sustainable path. And as you can see, we've highlighted in red, we were the, the first healthcare organisation in the world to declare a climate and health emergency in 2019. Always brave to be the first and put your head above the parapet. So uh, Dame Jackie Daniel, our CEO, was first to do that. Um, and it's actually one of the reasons why I applied for the job at the Trust. I knew the level of ambition that was there and I really wanted to be part of an organisation that was committed to action. So this is Dame Jackie Daniel, our CEO. What does it mean to declare a climate and health emergency? Well, first of all, it was a public acknowledgement of the climate crisis. And importantly, Dame Jackie was the first to say which threatens population health. She was the first to make a climate and health crisis declaration or emergency declaration. And what that means is a commitment for Newcastle hospitals to fast track our action to reduce our carbon emissions, which science demands, as we've heard in the previous two um, presentations and reference to the most recent IPCC reports. And importantly, it's also about collaborative action to, to deliver a net zero carbon Newcastle. I always say we're all in the same battle here. Um, it's all about shared learning and collaborative action. And uh, importantly, that involves you know, other trusts and, and networks like this, but it also involves collaborating with our suppliers, which is um, something we're very committed to. 
I've got a little bit about the climate emergency as the previous two presenters have as well, just to take one example of the heat wave this summer that affected um, the UK. I'm sure we will all remember it um, in July, so the 15th of July 2022. Um, so it was a level four, first time ever um, that we've had a level four major incident, which was a national emergency response, which meant we had to um, implement our emergency response procedures within the hospitals. Um, and that had a very real impact, um, whether it's extreme cold or extreme temperature, it is having an impact locally. As Pete says, it, it isn't just a, a you know far away countries that we tend to think about when people talk about global warming, but it's, it's people, uh, it's our patients, it's our number one priority is our patient care in the UK. Okay, and it impacts on our on our um, estate as well. You know, we had lots of examples where our air handling units couldn't handle the temperature and shut down. We had surgeries that had to be cancelled and postponed. I know one of the trusts in London, their IT system went into meltdown and it wasn't functioning for 10 days. So it's not just directly on human health. It's also on our on our estate and our ability to deliver care. But in terms of hum impact on the human body, um, this sort of fascinated me in the summer, which was guidance between when does heat exhaustion become heat stroke and what's the difference between those two terms? Uh, and it's it's pretty much a temperature threshold that sits around about 40 degrees centigrade. So the human body is designed to um you know, to to exist within a, a narrow range of temperature, a few degrees here or there. Um, so, but up to 40 degrees is whenever the body temperature is beginning to overheat. And the symptoms that you might feel, dizzy, faint, excessive sweating, rapid, weak pulse, etc. And the first aid guide is lay the person down in a ventilated area, drink water, um, sponging or with cool water, fanning and monitoring the person. So that's heat exhaustion. It becomes a medical emergency when that becomes heat stroke, which is when you exceed 40.5 degrees. Symptoms become more extreme, throbbing headaches, no sweating, red hot, dry skin, rapid, strong pulse, may lose consciousness. At this point, call an emergency number, lay the person down. And really, it's it's all about speed of action. And that made me think of a parallel which, with a. Uh, the earth and um, with uh, our uh, climate emergency. So I produced this slide to just draw some of these parallels. So on the human body, the typical reported range is between 36.5 and 37 degrees centigrade. That's comfortable for the human body. Heat exhaustion is when that creeps up nearer 40 degrees. If left untreated, heat exhaustion may evolve into heat stroke and can become a point of no return where the body's thermoregulation mechanisms fail. This leads to a medical emergency with symptoms of confusion, disorientation, convulsion, unconsciousness, hot, dry skin, core body temperature exceeding 40 degrees for between 45 minutes and eight hours. This can then result in cell death, organ failure, brain damage or death. This is a very serious, life threatening medical emergency. And we can draw this parallel with the planet. The global optimum temperature is 15 degrees centigrade. That's our average temperature on planet Earth. The global temperature is currently 1.2 degrees above that natural range and is currently classed as a climate emergency. Current emissions are driving greater warming. We're on a trajectory to pass a temperature threshold of 1.5 degrees above the pre-industrial natural range, the predicted point of no return where the Earth's thermoregulation mechanisms fail. And I think this is the bit that's not perhaps so clearly communicated. If we go beyond this 1.5 degrees of additional warming, the scientists warn that we could set off irreversible chain reactions of positive feedback loops. We're talking about things like redu reduced albedo effect, which means reduced sea ice um, or, or ice cover at the North Pole and the South Pole, reducing the reflectivity of the planet. Loss of permafrost, which again reduces the reflectivity, but also releases methane stores. Reduced vegetation cover. All of those sorts of um, impacts are predicted to lead to a positive feedback loop driving runaway warming with symptoms of increasing heat waves, floods, storms, droughts and secondary symptoms of sea level rise and land loss. 
It is already resulting in a loss of wildlife, coral reef bleaching, species extinction, crop failure, reduced drinking water availability, property and infrastructure damage and human health impacts and death. We are already in a climate emergency. It seems if you put the word climate before it, people discount the word emergency, but we really must act urgently and aggressively to really reinforce what previous presenters have said. So therefore, this is our climate emergency strategy, which takes us to 2025 and our goals that we have set. I'm just going to pull out the carbon goals. And what you'll see is that we're aiming to get to net zero by 2030 for our carbon footprint. That's 10 years earlier than the default NHS target that applies to every NHS trust in the UK. That is because we've committed to acting with urgency and with increased ambition and also to bring our supply chain to net zero by 2040. No small task, I might add, but that's what the ambition is. So where did we start? Um, when I first took the role at um, Newcastle Hospitals, one of the things James Dixon had wanted me to do was to bring the smart carbon expertise into the, the hospital and working with the team at Smart Carbon, we actually were successful in getting funding from the Northeast Local Enter Enterprise Partnership, which meant there was zero cost to the trust. Clearly, we went through all the due diligence and all the conflict of interest processes with our HR and with our supply chain and procurement colleagues just to make sure there was no conflict um, with my two hats there, um, but um, zero cost to the trust. And what we did, first of all, was get our own house in order. So we actually measured our own footprint again. Now, we have been doing that. The team have been doing that on Excel spreadsheets and using those free emissions factors that um, have been previously mentioned. But, um, you know, Laura Middlemass, who was leading on that, had said to me, it was fit for purpose for a long time, but I'm now a little bit uneasy that if people look too closely, it may not be as complete and as accurate as it should be. So we decided, right, let's start again. We've already published 2019, but let's redo 2019 again. So we brought in a master's student from Northumbria University and he supported us with the task and we put everything through the Smart Carbon platform. We revisited the greenhouse gas protocol as well as the NHS net zero guidance and produced a, a more complete and comprehensive picture. And on the bottom corner here, you'll see that the previous reported um, carbon footprint and then the newly reported carbon footprint for the same time period, there was a 43% uplift. That's not because we included more data sources. It's just because we improved the methodology and increased the accuracy of what we were doing. So that meant we all had confidence in our baseline and that meant we could track our reductions. Clearly, if we're trying to track a reduction against an understated footprint, we would have made a rod for our own back. So it's better to have the most complete and most accurate um, base year possible. And we've worked with multiple trusts now to, to replicate that and get that baseline and in, in process. Um, a ninja left us with his, our master student mess, left us with this um, methodology and uh, procedure, which I'm happy to share with anybody that would like that. Um, and it is based on the greenhouse gas protocol and the five principles for for um, relevant, complete, consistent, transparent and accurate reporting. They're very closely linked to car to um, financial accounting principles. So greenhouse gas accounting and financial accounting do actually follow quite a few of the same the same principles. Um, you've seen this slide before. Um, so we've got all the greenhouse gases at the top here, which, um, as Ar Ariel explained, all have different global warming potentials and can be converted into different um, greenhouse or carbon dioxide equivalents. So that's how you get a, a normalised CO2e, which is carbon dioxide equivalent carbon footprint. Um, and taking into account all of these different emission sources. So this is one of our most recent reports. I can put this link actually in the chat box as well. And what we're really pleased with now is we have that 2019 robust baseline. And then by consistently replicating the same methodology year after year, we've been able to track change and quite happily can report a reduction in some areas, you know, reduction of 23% anaesthetic gases, reduction of 78% in our trust fleet, reduction in water, reduction in business travel. Our two main challenges um, are our building energy, which is this green segment here, which is our um, carbon footprint. Now, we do actually have our own on-site um, combined heat and power plant. Um, and 
we're locked into that until 2027, but we cut, we supplement that with energy we buy from the national grid as well. And unfortunately, with the you know challenges that we're all familiar with of an old and aging estate, um, we are seeing that creep up. It's gone up 30 percent. So our energy manager Cara Tabaku is has a has a plan to um to tackle that. But the uh, the biggest area of growth is procurement, which has gone up 50 percent, which is the blue area. So this is more than 65 percent of our carbon footprint. And um, OK, we can't control that, but we can influence that. That's the area I lead on. I'm responsible for that net zero by 2040 goal. So here what you'll see is this is dotted line is our carbon budget. We don't have a science based target. Instead, we went directly to the Tyndall Centre, who are based at Manchester University, who are um, a body of the UK's leading climate scientists. And we work with them to produce our own carbon budget, which is aligned to the 1.5 degree aspiration of the Paris Agreement. And as Ariel nicely explained earlier, it's the cumulative space underneath the curve that is important. So it's not a direct line down to 2050. It's about urgent rapid cuts to bring that down. If you took a direct path to 2050, the cumulative emissions would be higher. However, here's our actual performance. And the problem is we've overshot our own carbon budget, um, which is disastrously disappointing for the whole team. Uh, we all feel so passionately about aligning our action to 1.5 degrees. It worries me immensely that people keep telling us we're a leading trust and that the and that the NHS is leading in the world. And I just translate that as well, if we're leading and the NHS is leading and we're not in line with 1.5 degrees, then as Pete outlined, our actual likelihood of achieving a cap at 1.5 degrees is becoming increasingly unlikely. But can we at least get our own operations in line with that scientific requirement? So we've we've overshot, as you can see, excess emissions here. These are our projected emissions for 2022-23, way above the blue line carbon budget. So what we do know is in the longer term, we're going to have a chance to take back control of our energy centres and our CHP plant in 2027. By 2028, there's exciting um, plans coming online with Newcastle City Council for a, a citywide heat network. So we might see big stepped reductions then. In the interim, we've got a window of opportunity for um, increased efficiency and reducing energy demand. So what we're at really is a, is a situation like this. We're in zone A um, and we previously knew that our carbon budget, budget required us to reduce our footprint by 12.8% every year. We've had to recalculate that. We now need to reduce our footprint by 18% every year to bring us back under that budget and compensate for the overshoot we've already put into the atmosphere. So our most recent report, we very much took this tone. We called it our red flag report. Um, yes, we've won lots of awards at Newcastle and that's lovely, but awards for projects aren't making a difference to the atmosphere, the carbon emissions in the atmosphere. And this isn't a scientific chart, but you can see our general messages despite all of these wonderful projects we're doing. And we're very proud of the work the team have done. These incremental changes aren't going to cut it. It's large scale organisational transformative change that is required. We are in the 11th hour here and we must see huge slashes in carbon emissions rather than pat ourselves on the back for incremental change. So looking more closely at where those emissions are growing, as I've mentioned, scope three, um, the, the, the um, hash line here for procurement is one of the biggest growth areas. So looking more closely at that, first of all, the methodology we have historically used is a very common methodology, which is spend based method. Um, and that gives us this breakdown here. We can see we're spending most of our of our spend with pharmaceutical and blood products, building and engineering, etc. But there's a problem. There's numerous problems with this methodology, this spend based method. The factors are arbitrary. They were developed in 2007 and they haven't been um, revised, even though all other emissions factors are revised annually. Our spend is increasing each year and with inflation that's pushing it even higher, although we have adjusted these spend class factors to um, take into account inflation. 
But most importantly, this method does not capture real life reduction efforts of individual suppliers. So we're talking directly to suppliers. And let's take, for example, supplier A might provide, um, let's take pharmaceuticals as an example to us. And they may have invested in solar panels across their factory and an electric fleet to deliver their products to us. Whereas supplier B may not yet have started that journey. With this method, if we spend more with supplier A, if their product is, is a penny more expensive, it will look like their carbon emissions are higher, which is clearly not reflective of practice. And most importantly, if they're making progress towards net zero and their emissions are reducing year on year, we won't capture that if we're spending the same amount or higher. So we need to move away from this method. It's it's useful as a one off exercise. It's like a scoping screening exercise that gives you a feel for the size of the carbon um, emissions from your procurement, but it's no use for year on year reporting at all. So looking at the NHS position and some very clear messages coming from the centre that by 2030, the NHS will not procure from any supplier that hasn't published their own net zero target. That's a fantastic message out to the entire 80,000 supplier base to the NHS that unless you've got a published net zero target, you won't continue to do business with the NHS. Now that applies from 2030. We wanted to jump in sooner than 2030. So we also looked at what else, what other pressures were on suppliers. The central team have released this NHS supplier roadmap um, covering a lot of things that have come in the previous um, presentations about social value and carbon reduction plans. I'm not going to replicate that. Um, they've also released a supplier assessment called the Evergreen Assessment. This is voluntary for suppliers to do this. It's made up of a hundred questions. So what we decided to do was streamline it and just pick out the ones of most importance to us in that 2040 net zero vision. So we picked out um, things that the suppliers will be asked anyway, and we developed our own five step framework. We also revisited the greenhouse gas protocol, this time looking at the technical guidance for scope three um, carbon emissions. This is a really useful um, graphic from the uh, Greenhouse Gas Protocol Guidance, which looks at category one. So scope three has 15 categories. Scope three, category one is purchased goods and services. And this is a decision tree for how organisations should decide the best method to measure their carbon footprint. So first of all, based on screening, does the purchase goods or services contribute significantly to scope three? Well, we've done that screening with the spend based method, and yes, it's at least 65%. The second part of this question is, or is supplier engagement otherwise relevant to your business goals? Well, yes, we really want to have direct conversations with our suppliers, build relations with them and, and work together towards this shared um, ambition of reducing carbon. The next question is, is data visible? available in the physical quantity of the purchase goods or services. Well, yes, we have got that. We know how many, you know, MRI scanners we've bought, for instance. But can the tier one supplier provide product to the level cradle to gate greenhouse gas emissions? That's a full life cycle assessment. The answer here is no. A handful of our suppliers can, but not many. It's also inherently problematic looking at life cycle assessments. It's typically once every five to 10 years that a company will do a life cycle assessment on any one product and they may have thousands of products in their catalogue. Also, each co company will probably have slightly different approach to that and a different methodology, which makes it very difficult to compare and contrast life cycle. So we've said no to that and we've gone down to the next question, which is can the supplier provide allocated scope one and two data of sufficient quality to meet their business goals. That essentially means is the supplier itself measuring its own organisational level carbon footprint? The answer here is yes, because they all have to, whether they're, you know, have to do it for SECR legal reasons or whether they have to do it for, for reporting reasons. So we are currently using the hybrid method. You can see the user spend based method is the bottom of that hierarchy. And we've, you know, we've moved up two levels here to the hybrid. So what we then need to do is look at scope three, category one. So for each supplier, what we really want moving up from spend based method is this average, uh, this hybrid method where we want the supplier to send us their data. Um, and ideally, we want their scope one and two data specific to their product and their upstream 
emissions as well, which means we need their scope one and two footprint, but also the materials they've extracted, the waste they've generated, the transportation of getting the product to us. So we're asking the supplier, the onus is on them to measure their own impact and report it to us. And that's why um, you know, we've developed this um, this five step process. I'll just wrap up now shortly. So um, we've tried to really simplify it. Um, Dan Shelley, our head of, of procurement, our director of supply chain and procurement, didn't want to come down with a hammer in 2030 and say to suppliers, oh, you haven't got a net zero target. You can no longer supply to us. What he wanted to do was build this framework. So first step was we actually asked our suppliers to tell us, what do you think of this ambition to get to net zero by 2040? It's a big ask. What are your thoughts about this? So what we were so thrilled with was 756 suppliers responded. That's 22% of our supplier base. 98% of them wholeheartedly supported our ambition to get to net zero by 2040. A few of them said, oh, we'd a 2050 target or a 2045 target. Is that going to be OK? But the, not one said you know, you're putting too much pressure on us. We can't take this on. We're not, you know, we're not interested in net zero. Not one. We had zero pushback. OK, this is the 22 percent early adopters that responded to us, but still the indications are really positive. So step two was we thought we'd offer the supplier some support. So we asked them what sort of support they wanted, and then we built a series of webinars, guidance notes, information packs, frequently asked questions, case studies from other suppliers. And we've put it all on our website, that link that I've um, put in the chat box. So we've got recordings of previous webinars, but we run them annually. So we're into our third year of doing that. And step three is we now want the suppliers to report their data to us. Now that's free, zero cost to the supplier. We give them a free page on the Smart Carbon portal to plug in their data. If they don't have the answers and they don't have the information ready to plug in straight away, which is a 10 minute job, then we signpost them to um, Smart Carbon Lite, which we've developed at cost and is at no cost to any supplier, so they can do a rough and ready carbon calculation. But we also point them to those free government factors, those Bez DEFRA factors, and they can do it on an Excel spreadsheet if they wish. Um, so they've got lots of ways they can get this information. For most of them, they'll be doing it anyway. It'll be in their reports. You know, we've got the likes of Johnson and Johnson on board. You know, they were really keen to get in 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 to be you know one of the first to complete and for them it's a simple case of copy and paste out of their published reports the next question we ask the supplier is have they published a net zero target and if so what date and our minimum date is 2040 not 2050 not 2045 it's 2040 and the final question we ask them is have they published a carbon reduction plan so yes if they're on a framework that's over 5 million they'll need to do that anyway under ppn 0621 but we've not put any financial threshold in this we want every supplier to have a plan to reduce their carbon footprint so that's the screenshot of the link that i've sent to you um I'll share the slides afterwards. I've maybe run out of time now, but I've just got here screenshots of what suppliers have said in the surveys. But what I was so thrilled about was we got a good mix of, of different sizes of organisations. But interestingly, 30 percent of the ones that opted into this programme were micro businesses with 10 or less people. We were constantly getting the message of you need to make exceptions for SMEs and give them a two year grace period. They don't want that. They actually tell to tell us they want to get involved. They just need a bit of help and support. So we the majority of SMEs and micro businesses, but still a healthy um, cohort of large businesses. We also had a nice spread across different E class codes, different categories. Happily, the biggest percentage reporting or engaging are the biggest um, our biggest spend category. So that was a happy coincidence. And then this is, you know, their support, 87% in full support, 12% who said they're not sure, even the 1% who said no, when I clicked on it, they'd said, we've set a 2050 target, we're just not sure we can commit to 2040. Not one of them said, we don't want to go on this journey to net zero. Um, but what was interesting is we asked them, have you published a net zero target? 30% have no plans to publish a target, yet we need every supplier to publish a target by 2030. That's mandated. And also 30% have no plans to publish a carbon reduction plan. Yet from April this year, 
if they're supplying anything above five million, they're going to need to. So for me, that was a bit of an alarm bell that maybe the messages are getting through to suppliers. Maybe there's a lack of awareness um, of what's coming around the corner for them, which is why we wanted to build the support. Um, and this is just, you know, obviously I cherry pick some feedback here, but as I had zero negative feedback, this was an easy task. But I just it made my day to read these sorts of comments straight from the suppliers saying they think it's a fantastic initiative, really keen to get engaged. Um, and the final sort of output is this is what the dashboard looks like. So the suppliers upload their performance data. So you can see, you know, there's B Braun there or GE Healthcare, Johnson & Johnson, NHS Blood and Transplant. We can see what their footprint is and we see their current year, their previous year and their base year. And when we've got their direct scope one, two and three footprint, we use that data in our reporting. And because we also ask them their turnover and their value of sales to Newcastle hospitals, we can do two things with that information. One is we can proportion their emissions to us. So let's say for argument's sake, one supplier provides 50-50 to us and Liverpool, Liverpool hospitals who are also using the same programme. We would split their emissions 50-50. Um, but also because we know their value of sales, we can subtract it from that spend code method um, and we'll continue to do the spend code method for the suppliers that aren't yet reporting and we'll blend the results to get this hybrid result here. But really, before 2040, we, we're, we're actually making this a contractual requirement. It's mandatory for every supplier to report this data to us because only then we will we be able to see if our scope three emissions are no longer growing but are starting to reduce. It's the only way to track a reduction to net zero. And that's the objective for 2040. And I always say that that just ha happens to coincide with my retirement age. And I will kick back in the year 2040 with a glass of wine if we've helped 3,400 suppliers get to net zero. I will feel that's been a career well spent, time well spent. Those are just some screenshots of the reporting page. We don't, we haven't reinvented anything. This is the government PPN 0621 template um, for a carbon reduction plan. And oh, just some screenshots from last week. We were, we're having some one to one visits with suppliers. So we actually went out to NHS Supply Chain and Supply Chain Coordination Limited. Um, so some of you may know Heidi Bernard, Head of Sustainability, and Emma Nuttles, our, our contact. And this is our team here from Newcastle. And we had a brilliant day on site talking to them about the challenges of getting to net zero and how they're going to, they're reporting, their, they're reporting all emissions to us. So any trust that uses, um, uses supply chain, their emissions are being monitored. So I'll stop there. Those are my contact details. Um, and uh, please do get in touch if you've got any questions. And if you've got any questions about my other hat, Smart Carbon, don't contact me. Contact um, Lee Jackson, our commercial director, and he'll happily give you, you know, a free demo of the platform and so on. Um, and I've put those links in the chat box, so I'll stop there. So there's some time for questions. Fantastic. Thank you, Annalisa. Really, really interesting. And, and seeing what you're you're doing to support um, companies to to work out their carbon impact and, and work with trust is really, really interesting. And I'm, I'm just blown away by it. And as Pete has put in the, the chat, that the, the hard hitting, honest reflection, I think, is, is really, really important. And it's amazing that that it hasn't taken the usual public sector approach of trying to bury um, bad news for something else I've, while, while people put questions in the chat and please please do ask questions they're a very very quiet group um uh, so so yeah please i've got a question you mentioned that liverpool is using your program have you had much interest from other trusts or do you know of other trusts who are taking the same but slightly different approach yeah okay kathy i'll put my smart carbon hat on for that question then um, yeah, we do. We're working with Liverpool hospitals, Northumbria Healthcare Hospitals, NHSBT. We're working with 10 trusts in London. That they set up a climate um, coalition through their ASHN. Is it called UCLP? Is yeah, that the equivalent of the ASHN? One, yeah. yeah, so they've set up a climate collaborative. And um, so what we did actually, we started with the training course and we um, they um, found a volunteer from each of the 10 trusts in London to do the two day advanced course in carbon footprinting. And I loved it. I had delivered that one. I have to say the conversation in the classroom is the best, you know, the, the most useful. Everybody's sharing challenges, sharing ideas and, and going on this same 
sounds really corny going on this same journey together, but, you know, this same challenge of measuring and reporting and reducing, importantly, reducing a carbon footprint. So they've all done the training and then are going to be using the, the platform to measure because what we've been able to set up is a dashboard to link all those accounts. So there's one overarching dashboard for the region. We have a similar project potentially in the northeast that hasn't been approved yet, but it's looking at the ICS, the Northeast and North Cumbria ICS ICB network. And again, having a dashboard there. So basically, you can have a dashboard of trusts and then each trust can have their own dashboard of suppliers. But any suppliers that are reporting into more than one trust, they only need to fill it in once mm -hmm. and it gets proportioned out. And because we're working, you know, the healthcare sector isn't the only sector because we're working with lots of councils and other companies. So say, for instance, Gateshead Council, S Sunderland City Council, you know, they're CDPA rated. They're using the platform. We're talking to Newcastle City Council. So their suppliers are also our suppliers. So it means that, you know, we can share that data share that information and share that influence you know get because if you take newcastle city council as an example they've published a net zero plan for the city to be net zero by 2030 so our messaging is consistent it's actually one of the reasons why newcastle hospitals went for 2030 rather than the nhs greener 2040 um target is so that we can align with our local authority mm -hmm. fantastic thank you um, and uh, I mean, there are people, are, are you having technical problems or, or are you just blown away by everything that you've heard? So, so I would really like to ask people on the call, what what are your reflections on what Annalisa has said? And you don't need to, um, you don't need to, to put your hand up if you don't want to, but putting stuff in the chat, I think would be really helpful for us so that we understand your point of view on this as well. We need some music. We need some tumbleweed music, don't we, to, to play at points like this. Have I just bored everybody or what happened? <laughs> no, I, I think I think there's a lot of information and people are digesting it. Uh, I can see that Saima is is typing. So um, so I'm hopeful that uh, that she'll have a question. Pete, go on, fill the gap. Yeah, just while people are typing and concentrating, I think the um, you know it's great to bring all this together, and it, it still strikes me, Annalisa, that there's probably a role continued to get more of us together. I mean, Heidi, like you say, brilliant lady, doing some great work supply chain. Um, we obviously want to try and find that innovation that can help uh, the supply chain in various areas, um, from from decarbonising to. Uh, to actually being a, a supplier on there themselves um, and, and providing the NHS with products that we think are a bit greener. Um, but I just wonder whether there is maybe something missing. I think that's probably my question. Is there is there an ecosystem still missing um, where we can bring some people together um, to, to to continue to connect and collaborate and and work together on this challenge? So that's that's my question. Open question to to anyone really. Thank you, Pete. While people are thinking about that. Um, Ariel, you've got your hand up as well. Uh, yeah, it's not really a question necessarily. I think I just wanted to um, echo what Pete and others were saying. I really appreciated the level of transparency. So I really liked, well, I thought it was really um, an interesting visualization where you you demonstrated that your emissions continue to go up despite all these changes. And I think that's just, again, this is not, um, I was trying to, in my own presentation, I wanted to say, like, or, or reflect on that quote that perfection can be the enemy of progress. So you're taking steps and all of them are really important steps and you're still seeing that something is going up. That wasn't that wasn't to say that, that OK, scrap everything and give up. I thought that was just a really, really a really good way of showing that this is something that is a journey that we have to keep going on and you will make changes. And all of those look like really important to, changes to make. But even with those changes, there's still going to be this this really big challenge. So I just really appreciated the the level of transparency within that. Thanks. Thank you, Ariel. I think we we all did. Um, Saima, PhD in sustainability in the NHS. Yes, it's um it, it is really interesting to see the work that's going on. And please do contact any of the the presenters today when you get your ethics. Um, one of the things that we have been doing in Yorkshire and Humber is is working with innovators to do a bit of a. a I wouldn't call it research because it's not, but a, a bit of an assessment as to how how confident SMEs feel when um, when assessing their carbon impact 
in order to apply for funding from government. And I think that this resonates with what you were saying, Annalisa, that, that an awful lot of companies have very little understanding of, of the targets that they need to meet and what they need to do and how to get started. And I guess I would just make the point that um, that you know, this is something that the, the, the NHS is here to help you with. Do not struggle on your own. Companies like Hill Dickinson, companies like the AHSNs um, and, and NHS Trust, we are we are all here to help because this is important to all of us. Uh, Alex has asked a question in the chat. A substantial amount of media criticism around the potential of, of carbon offsetting and carbon capture. Um, does the panel have views on this subject? Pete, you've got your hand up. Is that about this question? It is indeed. I do. Um, I do have some views on this. In fact, I, I've got a meeting next week um, with um, uh, someone around carbon offsetting, and we've we've tried to shine a bit of a spotlight on this. But I think it's worth doing again. So it's it's playing in my mind to maybe to put a spotlight on the topic. And um, I think carbon offsetting is often frowned upon, um, and the reason being is that people don't want it to be um, a get out of jail that we still consume fossil fuels and then we just offset. And I get that. That's absolutely fundamental. However, if we don't um, see the importance of offsetting, we're going to miss a trick. Um, and nature plays a massive role. And again, in the IPCC report, you'll see that um, planting trees is great. And I still think that is definitely beneficial. But they also talk about preserving um, the current ecosystem that we've got and looking after it. Um, so I think that's a, a really good recommendation in that report. Um, but the reason I think this is an important topic is there are some standards that we need to adhere to. There are some legitimate organisations that can help with offsetting. Um, but if we don't do it the robust, legitimate way, um, we are in danger of, of, of contributing negatively to it. So, for example, I spoke to a company who said they were net zero. And when I asked them how they would approach that, they said they would planted some trees on their land. Now, I do that on my own property. But I can't make a claim that I'm net zero by doing that because you don't know if I'm going to cut them trees down next week. And that's the reality. So you've got to invest in legitimate schemes. And there's some brilliant standards out there that help guide people. And um, so I just think it's a topic that we need to shine a spotlight on, need to help people. But why wouldn't we? And again, I speak selfishly about the UK. Why wouldn't we want to invest in the UK nature based solutions um, when they could have such a brilliant impact on our um, on our natural habitat and you see some excellent examples from seagrass restoration peatland restoration to planting trees and woodland habitat so i'm a big fan of it i think it's needs to have a spotlight on it, it shouldn't be frowned upon uh, but yeah we, th we need to get off fossil fuels as well thanks Pete. ariel and then annalisa um yeah i mean i, I think like p i do have some some strong views on this and i've gone a few ways from being really disappointed that that seemed to be the way it was going where you didn't really need to worry about your emissions and this really strong focus was on the end goal this carbon neutral without really focusing on the the way to get there so um i've kind of come back a little bit i think similar to what pete's just said as long i mean there is absolutely a role for really um impactful verifiable offsets first thing is to reduce emissions as much as possible in a, in a real way but i think also um, what I especially connecting um, one one area that I've been interested in in digging into more is where the social values and the offset can can also coincide. So it could be a space where um, while you are you know the goal is eventually to get to this net zero, but you can also use the the pull to invest in some offset scheme as a way to contribute to um, a healthier environment for people actually living in an area. So it, I, I I've also viewed it as while it's not a way to pawn off the responsibility towards the future, it could be a way to to really, again, look for something that's verifiable, look for something that will be taken care of long term, and also something that just contributes really positively to the area that it's in. Um, so it's, it, it, the other the other kind of positive from our perspective is, is it's I'd like to also consider it as a way to for people to connect quite personally with with nature. So um, it's not. While there's, I think it's a, it's a very space to be very careful in. We don't use offsets as as um, negating the rest of our responsibility. There is a really important role, um, as long as it's done in a really thoughtful way to consider the long term, um, how how they'll affect long term um, emissions and and will it actually be taken care of and will it actually 
follow what it says they're going to do. So lots of options there. So I, I think just really similar to what Pete said, there there is there is a positive role for them as long as it isn't the first thing that that we go to. Thank you, Ariel. I agree with everything that, that you both said. And Elisa. Yeah, very, very similar views really to Pete and Ariel. It's a, it's a good question. Um, comes up a lot in the carbon footprinting course that we run. And I think um, it's about understanding, well, it's quite a few things, the, the difference in the definition of carbon neutral and net zero. So carbon neutral is when you can buy offsets to just balance your emissions. And a lot of, as Pete says, firms will mistakenly claim they are net zero when in fact they're carbon neutral. Because in actual fact, to be net zero, according to the um, guidelines, you can only offset between 5 and 10% of your baseline footprint. And you need to reduce your emissions by 90 to 95% in order to claim that you're actually net zero. So a lot of companies, I think, have set themselves net zero targets. I see a lot of firms, certainly with my consultancy hat on, a lot of firms said, oh, we'll be net zero by 2027. When what they mean is they'll be carbon neutral by 2027. Um, and therefore, they're in very, uh, they need to be very careful about, you know, potential greenwashing and, and the backlog of that. So I think it's, understanding the definitions and publishing what the definitions mean to you. I think Ariel said that in her presentation. Somebody said about put a definition, your own definition of of what you, you said you're going to be net zero by such and such a date. What does that mean? And include an off, uh, uh, um, offsetting um, statement. The other thing is the type of offset that you use. It's better to, to use offset removals rather than offset avoidance. And then obviously the type of carbon credits that you have and if they're high quality, verifiable carbon credits. Um, I mean, there is a nice, IEMA produce a nice um, greenhouse gas hierarchy. And we're all familiar with the waste hierarchy. We all know that we should eliminate and reduce and reuse before we think about recycling and landfilling anything. Well, offsetting is like the recycling world. We can't recycle our way out of the out of the waste problem. So with carbon emissions, it's about eliminating them in the first place or reducing them where we can and only considering offsets. Yes, I I, I also see a lot of benefits and values. If they're part of a portfolio of action and they're proportional and you've got that hierarchy approach and your efforts in the right place, then yes, absolutely, I can see, see a place for offsets. Um, so, yeah, just being informed and being transparent and just being careful not to be um, seen to be greenwashing, I think, would be my advice with offsetting. What what does disappoint me is I have asked the NHS Greener team on the back of all of that what the NHS position is on offsets. And we don't have one. They won't publicly say any position. It's quite controversial, as you can imagine. But, um, you know, it, I do feel there's a little bit of head in the sand approach at the moment with offsetting because it's yes, absolutely. We focus on emissions reductions um, aggressively, but that doesn't seem to be happening either. <laughs> so I almost feel well, we should offset the excess above our budget then. Is there an argument for offsetting the excess? And then it becomes a, a price incentive, like almost like a carbon tax. Um, or if we're not spending it on offsets, can we ring fence the money we didn't offset and invest it in carbon efficiency and carbon reduction? I'm going off on a big tangent now, but anyway, you can see that it, it's not quite black and white with offsetting, but I think transparency is probably the most important thing. Be clear in your communication about what you mean by net zero and if you foresee a role of offsetting and if so, what type of offsets and, and what would you use them for? Thank you. Really, really interesting and, and useful. I've, I've learned some stuff there. Um, if there are no more questions, I think I will ask the panel to give their their takeaway point for um, for innovators and SMEs who want to work with the NHS uh, around net zero. So can I start with with um, Pete, please? One point, don't be frightened to put pen to paper um, and just make a start. Yeah, absolutely agree with that. Thank you, Pete. Ariel? Um, not to try to repeat too much, but focus on the next best step rather than what's getting too, too bogged down on this long term goal. What can you do right now that's going to make the biggest change right as, as quickly as you can? Thank you. Annalisa? 
Or without wanting to replicate the previous two people, I would just say as well, don't delay. It is a climate emergency. We absolutely, we should have acted 20 years ago. There is no justification for delay. Whatever you can do, just get started. And that's what we've tried to do is by simplifying it and giving those simple five steps. Just get on that first run of the ladder and get started um, because we haven't got any time to waste. Thank you. Yes, data is key to all this. Um, Peter's put in the the chat about the next chairing and learning session, which is likely to be on carbon offsetting. If you're interested, connect with with Pete on social media. He will put it all over social media, so you'll have the date and the details. Uh, so a huge thank you to everybody for joining us, and an even bigger thank you to Pete, Annalisa, and Ariel for um for a really interesting and excellent session. Um, we want these sessions to be as useful to you as they possibly can be so we'll be circulating a feedback form please do fill it in really really honestly in the spirit of of, of transparency um we, we can take the blows if you think there is something that we should do doing differently please let us know and if there's something you want us to continue doing also please let us know um, and then the next session is an online session on the 4th of may um, and the registration details will be uh, circulated amanda's just put them the details in the the chat there um amanda have we have we got the topic area sorted yes yeah, so we're potentially looking at low carbon infrastructure and so how to manage your estate and things like that thank you so if you're interested come along if you think you know people who are interested please let them know um and amanda will put the details of the speakers up on the um up on the screen or in the chat, please do uh, reach out, get in contact. As as Annalisa said earlier, this is this is about sharing and learning and collaborating. No one can do this on their own. We all need to work together to do it. So please do reach out. Thank you all very much. Have a lovely day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.